Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Essentially Sports. Uh, I'm searching for words uh, to introduce my guest for today. After all, it's not every day that you have two very special people gracing the show. To begin with, football is a common connection between this father-son duo. While the father was a powerful center forward who scored over 300 goals in his career, uh, well, the son, on the other hand, guarded the ever-so-charging opposition uh, forwards uh, from scoring a goal. Their objective on the football pitch might have been different, but their love for the world's most beautiful game uh, remains intact. It's time to welcome former Norwegian footballer Jan Age Fjortoft and Marcus. How are we doing, gentlemen? We're doing well, thanks. Well, that was a lovely introduction. I think that you, the 300 goals one sounded good, I think. So you you kick yeah. us off. Yeah, first of all, thanks thanks for having us on. And thanks for having us on also as father and son. And again, like Marcus said, thanks for the generous uh, introduction. Uh, and as a striker, I never count goals, but uh, the right number is 308. Yes. Uh, that was a small joke. I know every goal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I will just uh, kick on on this father-son uh, duo. So, you know, uh, I would like you guys to just let me know. We can start with you, Jan. How is Marcus as a son? And then Marcus for you, how is he as a father? Oh, uh, Marcus, uh, taking the football part of it, uh, we, we are a family of five. Uh, two of us very into football. Uh, Marcus uh, was with me in the dressing room uh, in Frankfurt, more or less from when he was born. Uh, he also, uh, th that was at the end of my career, but also Marcus is a special thing for me because when I came to English football, when I came to the Premier League, I, I had a str trouble at the beginning, small injuries, uh, didn't lose a bit confidence. And then that was the first half of the Premier League season. When Marcus arrived, the 12th of January 1994, I started scoring for fun. So he's also not only my son, he's also my lucky mascot. Very well said, Jan. What about you, Marcus? Well, for me, I mean, most of us grow up, I think, having uh, your father as as your hero as a, when you're younger and, and happily. And, and credit to dad for being such a good role model, I think that has persisted. Uh, throughout and I think the way you look at your dad I think stays the same but also changes so in, you can separate it between footballing terms obviously with within footballing terms you grow up as a kid and you love it and that's all you want to be and you get to be part of that world and that continued and I think you, as you get older you realize how impressive those achievements are because you gain more experience more references and so as I've gotten older, I've, I've come to appreciate more what that has accomplished. And then obviously what matters, I think, is obviously the personal connection and, and the relationship there in which he is a guidance and, uh, you know, just my main reference in, in, in life. And then obviously we find ourselves doing stuff together now when we get when I get older and, and kind of merging those worlds. And I think that is, uh, yeah, that's a that's a fun thing and a very meaningful thing for for I think our both of us to to do together. Right. Uh, very quickly, Jan, I will come to you. You have done it all. You have played as a as a former footballer. Now you're also an analyst. Now, uh, now that you look at the game from a from a third party, from an outsider point of view, how do you? Uh, has your perspective of the game changed at all? It's a good question. I think that uh, I think as a striker, when you get older, you start also think over how. When you were a player, what kind of skills did you have? Why did I succeed? Or say it another way, how did I take out my potential? As you were saying in your introduction, I was a goal scorer. I started quite early to analyze the game. I, I come from a very small village uh, in Norway with 900 people living in that uh, village. There's never been a professional footballer ever. And I felt that I had to, if, if I'm going to be... I, I never thought that I'm going to be a professional player. I, I just thought that I enjoyed my football and I had the, the will to improve, but all through analysis. So if you see my goals and if people find some black and white pictures of me at YouTube, they will see a striker who always look for the possibilities, always looking, analyzing things. I was not, I was not the quickest, but I was quite quick in my head. So, uh, as Johan Cruyff said once, uh, if you have to sprint, you're too late. 
And that was a good motto because then you had to analyze it, it all. And, and that's what I do now as well. I got a lot of great colleagues and Marcus included that knows a lot about players. I don't, I'm not sure who is the left back of Brighton. Uh, I'm not sure where he comes from, but I do know when when a game comes and when I work with it. And my job is then to see in a, in, a, in in the whole to try to understand why is he doing his job, how does he do it together with his centre half. And I think I always say to the guest I have, if I have someone pitch side, I want you to say exclusively what you think of the game. So if I worked with you, I would not say. So what do you say? If your opinion, you have that exclusive. That is your yours. And I think first, that is also the key to why football is so popular around the world, that everybody have an opinion, everybody based that on their knowledge and all that kind of things. And and my knowledge or privilege is that I've been in that situation a couple of times in my life. So I think that that but I'm, I'm very interested to to everything in and around football, ownerships, new rules, the, the different sports organizations. I'm more that kind of guy in our industry. It's it is very good that you hit on that point that you know there are new rules coming up and that is exactly where I was moving forward to Jan and the, this question is for both of you uh, you can take it one by one now like you said over the years you know football tactics and the player development has evolved right from your days to now when you see now what are the what are the changes that has impressed you the most and most importantly how do you see the technology shaping the future of this uh, beautiful sport. Do you want to go? Uh, if if yeah, yeah yeah I can start on that if, if I can start on that I, I'm I'm because I'm the oldest so I I remember when you were allowed to pass the ball back to the goalkeeper and, and the goalkeeper could grab the ball and you could do this imagine how easy it was to to keep a lead because you could kind of delay the game all the, all the time so the the game is improving I'm not one of those who says everything was better before there there were different aspects or maybe personalities, kind of uh, enjoyment, sometimes more passion in terms of teams uh, running around. But it's always, it's not, it's evolving all the time. And and I, I am positive that to every new tool that can improve our game, talking about VAR, yes, I can see all the negative sides of VAR, but in a principle, I am for tools that make it more fair. Uh, will it be 100% correct? Of course it won't. We will still discuss and it takes too long and all that kind of thing. But I try not to be that old grumpy man who says every change is for, for bad. We've seen a lot of change to our game lately. How, how you protect the, the, the great talented player. I remember in 82 World Cup when Claudio Gentile, the Italian defender, more or less killed Diego Maradona. That would never happen today. Gentile would have been sent off after 10 minutes. So there is always improvement, I think, to uh, to to do our game better. Yeah, I think. Yes. Well, yeah. If I take a different kind of um, angle, I guess it's um, like that said in terms of in terms of technology and how it can help. Uh, we see also the breakdown of the game. We see xgs. We see stats. We see all that comes with it. Expect saves and whatnot. And you know uh, what I would say is that we have to caution when when data becomes the all-consuming metric because within it you maybe lose a bit of of why we love the, what we love the game for and maybe certain profiles of players that I, we had before but no longer have i'm thinking more traditional tens and and what they contribute with and maybe those are things that we can't really measure maybe it's the it's the smoothness the suave the suave nature of the player and etc now it's how quickly you move the ball and how how you receive it and how efficient how is your output, et cetera. Of course, those should be metrics. But when you have those as kind of these all consume metrics, you maybe lose a bit those type of players that maybe many of us fell in love with and were our, like our first favorite players growing up. And so that's why I think, uh, yeah, it's an important metric. But of course, you need that discretion for the, the artistic eye, the subjective eye as well. Uh, now, yeah, and, and just are... if I if if I yeah, and yeah. I, I, if I just may say to add to it because you asked me how my perspective is to the game now. Yes, yeah. we can use XG, we can use X, XS and everything, but you have to see the the whole pictures. 
uh, it was quite interesting. This weekend, uh, I watched uh, Freiburg play my old club in Germany, Frankfurt. They scored three goals, great goals. And their XG was 187, meaning that, uh, that they were supposed to score 1.8 goals. Uh, but still, that means that, oh, was it just luck then? What, uh, whatever happened. So, so we, we must just to understand that the definitions of different things are also based on human uh, quality and also human errors. Uh, and many years ago, I had a, a, a privilege to talk football with Arsene Wenger, the legendary Arsenal manager. And he said, give me all information, give me all data. Uh, but he said, but it's my job as a coach to analyze it, how I'm going to use to understand the game. And I think that is a quite good philosophy. Right, uh, right, Jan. Uh, great, great insights on that. Uh, just moving from here to the uh, to the Norwegian football, uh, the the state of Norwegian football at present, and also I have to talk about you know Haaland. So you know no, Norway wasn't able to qualify for Euro twenty twenty four, and uh, also there was a lot of criticism around Haaland. Do you do you personally think that you know he's 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 an ex extremely talented player, no doubt about it. But at the same time, do you think that even the best of players require that? that additional help from the players around them to win at the national level. We all have seen what happened with Cristiano Ronaldo over the years at the World Cup. Uh, so, your thoughts? Yeah, but, but first of all, there is not a lot of criticism around Erling Haaland because Erling Haaland is maybe the best player in the world. Uh, yeah. And but, uh, but as you're saying, it's also hard to qualify alone. There's a lot of advantage being a Norwegian player, but one of the dis disadvantages is that you won't play in a lot of tournaments. I had the privilege to play at the World Cup in '94, uh, but the last time Norway were at a, 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 a Euro, uh, at an international tournament, was in 2000. The problem with our national team is that we have in Martin Ödegård, we have one of the greatest midfielder around, in Erling Haaland, one of the greatest number nine. Then we have some young kids like Nusa in Bruges in Belgium. We have Bob in Manchester City. The problem is they're all uh, offensive player. They're going forward. We, we, are, we are a very lack of the balance in the team. And we saw that in a qualification group when we played Scotland. We maybe ha had greater stars, so to say, in, in, in Ödegård and, and Holland. But just show you, we, we lack that um, balance in the team. We, we are struggling to come up with defenders. We are struggling, yes, Örjan Nyland is now playing in Sevilla. But still, he hasn't played so much the last years. And so we, we are a victim of... The, the, the talent that we have created in Norway at the moment, the, the wave is for, uh, for the players who plays offensive. Right. Yeah, uh... it's right. It's it's that you need defender. You need that, that sol solid foundation. And, and at the end of the day, there isn't the much that separates the best or the, the good between the great and the great between the best. Of course, there's the individual uh, swagger, which Holland, Odegaard and those likes provide. But you look at the back line, it's, it's, there's a big, big difference in quality. And to be fair, then you, you can't get away with that, especially at the very highest level. Right. Uh, Marcus, I'll continue with you here. Um, uh, and, and sticking with Haaland here still. Um, now, we all knew what happened at the FIFA and the Ballon, Ballon d'Or Awards. I mean, Lionel Messi was the, was the clear away winner and a large impact was because of the World Cup win and all. And do you think that uh, Haaland was, it was unfortunate that he missed out on, on, on these awards, number one. And the connecting question is the statement made by Cristiano Ronaldo or regarding that awards are losing its credibility. So how do you see these two things? First, the Haaland one. Well, obviously, I think, you know, that and I both would say that Holland Holland deserves it. If you look across the, the entire season, you're winning treble, you're beating goal scoring records for fun. I mean, it's it's you look if you're Holland, you think, what more do I have to do? And then you have to consider, at least for the Ballon d'Or, if I'm not mistaken, the World Cup did count for the FIFA World Pro. It didn't. But at the, at the same time, it's the players voting. So, <laughs> you know, it's it's them voting. So what can you say? But um you know, there with the World Cup, and there's a romanticism to it. Uh, what Messi did was historic, and so that obviously plays in the nostalgia, the romanticism of how that came to be. And Messi is the greatest ever, of course. But when we look across the season, and you do what Holland did over the course of that entire season, uh, and I'm careful to 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 spite Messi because Messi is Messi. But at the same time, it is over the course of the season of which I think Holland would deserve it. On the second point. 
of course, it's rich coming from the guy who, you know, is probably the most outspoken kind of um, supporter of individual awards when it goes his way. Uh, so I don't think we regard it. We can't regard as too much as Cristiano Ronaldo. I also happen to also like Cristiano Ronaldo, believe it or not. You can actually like the two of them at the same time. Uh, but Ronaldo will be the first to throw himself over the another Ballon d'Or as well. So I think we just leave it at, at that. Right. Uh, I think yeah. that, I think the main I, I think the main thing is about that award is that uh, we all first of all there's a lot of politics in there, uh, and the last years it's always been Cristiano Ronaldo or Lionel Messi. Uh, I think that uh, the Hollywood story about Messi winning the World Cup, I w I'm with Marcus over the season that should have been Holland, but we all expect that because of the winning of the World Cup with a drama against France in the final and so on, that that could be changed. What I didn't find right is the last award, the FIFA award. Uh, I think that, I mean, again, Lionel Messi, of all players who have played on this earth, he's probably the best. But I think that that the fact that the, the World Cup didn't count, I think that was not written with big letters in the letters sent to the players and coaches. But then again, that is how it is. Uh, and I said it in, uh, uh, in another interview. I said that if it was like Messi should win every award, then the Godfather would win every Oscar award ever because that is the, one of the greatest films ever. But, but I mean, that is politics and that's how it is. As for Cristiano Ronaldo, I'm with Marcus. Uh, Ballon d'Or uh, uh, was the best thing that could happen to anyone, so as long as he won it. I uh, know when Messi won it, they didn't have there. But that's that's fair enough. That is Cristiano Ronaldo. Amazing career, still doing it, still hungry, unbelievable. Right. I'm mean, like uh, just sticking to Ronaldo here, uh, Jan. Very quickly, do you feel that his move of returning to Old Trafford, which we all now knew how it panned out, was the right one in in your opinion? And now he's moving. Uh, now, when he has moved out after what happened with the manager and and how it was blown out in the media. Well, first of all, when he came, he did a great season. He was top scorer in, uh, for Manchester United. So it's easy to say that that ruined Manchester United. What we have seen that Manchester United are capable of ruining anything, also without Cristiano Ronaldo. I tell you a funny story. The game that he left uh, uh, the, the court before the end of the game, I was actually standing. Uh, outside the door when he came there. Uh, and I, and Cristiano Ronaldo, fir first he came off, up off the tunnel, went into the dress room. Three minutes later, he came out with his private gear and he was going out. And I was so close as telling him, please don't do that. That's not good for you. But I didn't. But I was standing there in the tunnel. So, uh, so I'm, I'm not one of them who says that it's, that, that it's his fault. First of all, he was picked up, had a great season. He contributed to that. Uh, and then I, I guess at the time, as it was, it was a right for both parties. He has gone to Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's doing a great job uh, adverting uh, a Saudi football. Uh, and uh, also was a start for a lot of stars going there. So he, he seems to be happy and he's still scoring goals. He, he still put up his record. He's getting, I guess that man will never grew up before he has reached a thousand goals I think he's on 870 or 880 and you can you can never think that he will not achieve that because he's broken every goal record around right I have a question for both of you uh, and, it, and it's obviously regarding because for uh, for the generation that I belong to and how I have seen football over the last 20 odd years the constant names have been Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. So you do you feel one, obviously you have to give the credit where is due, the kind of work that they have put in and the records that they have broken. But also at the same time, there have been so many careers that have been overshadowed by these two greats. So how do, how do you see this? I, I, if I could start, I think, I think we are blessed that we have seen two great players like the two of them. Not only have they done it one season or two seasons, these guys have done it for 15 years. And when you see the stats they're having, uh, goals scored, titles won. Of course, they played for Real Madrid, they played for Manchester United, Barcelona. They played for the best teams, but still amazing players. And, and, I, and I have never been into this thing that who is the best or like Marcus is saying, I think in our family, we love both. Uh, if if you if I was put on the spot to say I would say that Cristiano Ronaldo is the greatest goal scorer of all time and I would say 
Messi is the greatest player because what Messi is doing is amazing. I've been working a lot in Champions League. I've, I've been able to see him live. And what he can do, r- walking around and then just explode and take out five, six players, I've never seen something like it. And if, for your questions, overshadow, we could have seen players, there have been so many great players in the history of football. But the thing is with Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi, they've done it seasons after seasons after season, and they've never been injured. So that is unbelievable what we have been blessed to see these two guys. Marcus? Yeah, I mean, it's you have to. I think it's a it's a luxury problem, right? Because the fact that you have them overshadowing actually speaks uh, speaks kind of uh, just as to what they've been performing at, and that's what marks the be- uh, the great from the very very best, and that is the consistency by which you perform season in and season out. So, I think yeah, of course, you'll think uh, Savi or Iniesta should have won, or 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 a Ribery even that that year, and yeah, sure. But then you look at the legacy and, and and what we are witnessing with them. Well, well, will you ever see a, a greater duo at the same time in world football? I don't know. Obviously, you have Holland and Mbappe and, and all that comes with it. But even still, we should we just should look upon it as as a as a blessing. So uh, now there is thing that you know uh, that Holland might move to Real Madrid, and also there is a possibility that M- Mbappe might also move. So. Do you really feel that is it possible to accommodate both Mbappe and Haaland in the same team? First of all, Haaland going to uh, Real Madrid, that is a dream of the Real Madrid fans. Uh, er- Erling Haaland is at the club now, they win the most trophies. Players on his level, they want to be where they have most trophies. And the most guarantee you have just right now is Manchester City. So why should he go to Real Madrid now? Because may- what will happen in the future, nobody knows. But now he's got... Pep Guardiola as his coach. He is at the club that just won the treble. Uh, so I will, I will think that... I think he's played already in Norway, Austria, Germany, England. There is a pattern that seems that he wants to play in different countries, which is fair when you have the chance. I had a possibility to play in four different countries as well. I thought that was a fantastic life experience. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I guess I will advise anybody to do that. But, but let's see. At, at the moment, it's just wish, wishful thinking of Real Madrid. I think first they should be happy that they're getting Mbappé. Okay. Uh, now, now, there's, now there are a lot of stories uh, moving around that, you know, the, the footballing action, football centre is quickly moving towards Saudi, with Saudi pumping in a lot of money and attracting a lot of eyeballs from uh, from the world market uh, so so do you do you really see if saudi keep on making these strides do you see transfer records being broken in 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 the near future maybe with the likes of mo salah or maybe kevin de bruyne etc on the radar of saudi i think that we should never underestimate tradition i think that it takes time to build up a brand uh, but what we do know is that um, so far, this has been players at the end of their career that will go to Saudi Arabia. Uh, I think that uh, the attraction of the Bundesliga, Premier League, La Liga and Serie A will always be in ahead. But you see different leagues. I think that, I think this is my just of my opinion. I think this uh, project in Saudi is more sustainability than China was uh, when they ha- took a lot of players down there. Uh, I think that Saudi Arabia... Uh, will uh, will be in a longer term in in the market, but we just have to see uh, which way it goes. We see now uh, with the World Cup going there, uh, we, we see a lot of leagues having their finals there. But what I do know is a lot of the players are talking about this because you can imagine when they know that some of the teammates earning the triple or fourth time how much they'll do. But uh, I think that this. This is it's interesting to see how this will develop. We saw Jordan Henderson going back. We saw, uh, see Benzema have struggled there, uh, but but still, I think that they they will keep on doing that. It seems that they have put themselves a target. We know there is a lot of oil and gas in the world, so uh, we will they will probably be more invested. And we also know that Mo, Mo Salah uh, is one of their uh, favorites. So uh, let's see what's happening this summer without the Jurgen Klopp. What will happen to the players at Liverpool? Right, and I know that we are stacked against time, but I need one prediction from you. Uh, it seems Manchester City, Liverpool and Arsenal are the contenders for the Premier League title. 
do you feel we would see a repeat of the last season or can we have a new winner this time? Well, I've got a feeling the whole season when I saw Liverpool manage to come back and we saw Liverpool manage to win football games when they weren't that good, but they were winning games in a row. Uh, it's a Hollywood kind of ending to Jurgen Klopp if he wins the Premier League. Uh, but it's very, very close at the moment. And you just saw this weekend, 1-1 uh, uh, against Chelsea, you're losing two points. We are recording this uh, before they are playing uh, this game in hand. So we don't know the game against Brentford, how, how it will go. But this is, uh, I, I love it. And we, I, I also love, as you know, I love German Bundesliga. There's a very close race there after 11 seasons, Bayern Munich, maybe not the, the champion. And that's why I would put in a word for our, uh, the German football podcast that Marcus and myself have together. And it's very, very tight. And I think that's what we love. Uh, we love to see... If there are going to be three teams going all the way uh, in, in the Premier League, we saw now just a small thing, uh, Arsenal, or not a small thing, but a big thing for them over two games. Now they've got a great goal difference. So they're back in business also on the goal difference. So this is going to be a fantastic end uh, of the season.